Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning or good evening, depending on which part of the world you're in. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you today. My name is Benjamin Hopkins, and I'm the co-director of the East Asia National Resource Center. Um, it's my great privilege to uh, introduce today's event, where we're going to be talking about the Japanese health system and its history from uh, Hiroshima to Fukushima to COVID and the present health crisis. Um, We've got a fantastic speaker in Tomoko who's joining us from Georgetown today, the School of Public Health. Um, and to introduce her, we have one of our very own undergraduates at GW, Emerald O'Brien, who is also a research uh, undergraduate uh, assistant at the um, GW Institute for Korean Studies. Before I turn it over to Emerald to introduce Tomoko, um, I would like to just remind you that, as Richard said, uh, on your right hand side, you will see a panel for Q&A. If you have questions for the speaker, please put your questions in the Q&A panel. Uh, my, my staff and I will keep our eyes peeled for those. And when we get to the moderated Q&A session, uh, we will draw our discussion out of there. So please definitely do that. And if possible, when you do put a question in, please go ahead and identify yourself in terms of uh, your name and where you're from. So with that, I'll turn it over to Emerald, who will get uh, our substantive program kicked off. Emerald, over to you. All right, thank you, Professor Hopkins. Um, so hi, my name is Emmy O'Brien. I'm a junior in the Milken Institute School of Public Health, where I major in public health and my minor is in Japanese language and literature. As a public health student, I find studying Japan absolutely fascinating because it serves as a case study to learn about pertinent issues in the United States, ranging from universal health care coverage, natural disaster response, to even the challenges that come with an aging population. By sharing history and knowledge, it can also open doors for international cooperation, which now more than ever is crucial for tackling global health issues. It was a desire. It was a desire to learn more about history of medicine in Japan that led me to reach out to Dr. Steen and invite her to speak today. And I am exceedingly grateful to have her here today and for everyone else for giving your time to come to this event. And with that, I will introduce the topic of today's event. Um, like many countries, Japan is a universal healthcare system, and yet it is also one of the most unique systems of healthcare and research and development to, due to the complex history of medicine in Japan. Today's, today, um, our, our speaker, Dr. Steen, will summarize how the complexities of Japanese healthcare and R&D systems were established. Using this opportunity, she will also share how Japanese local and federal governments are managing the current COVID-19 pandemic. Dr. Tomoko Steen is an adjunct professor of microbiology and immunology at Georgetown University Medical Center. She teaches courses for the MS program on biomedical science policy and advocacy. She was a faculty member of George Washington University's Center for Recent History of Science, working under the director of the program and leading historian of recent science, Professor Horace Friedland Judson. Over the years, Dr. Steen has taken on a broad range of scientific research projects, ranging from theoretical population genetics to antibiotic resistance. She is currently researching the biological effects of radiation using gut microbiomics. In addition to her work in the sciences, Dr. Steen has researched a wide variety of humanities topics, such as the comparative history and policy of women in science, intellectual political history of Japan and Asia, comparative health policies, and sociology of scientific knowledge and controversies. She's frequently invited to review scientific journals and organizes the annual Nuclear Security Summit at Georgetown with the goal of generating cross-disciplinary discussions on nuclear disaster issues. And with that, I will pass it along to Dr. Steen. Okay, thank you so much. Um, Emerald, it's a wonderful <laughs> um, introduction. And uh, Emir and Ben and Richard, thank you so much for organizing uh, this um, became a you know, real event. And it is very hard to um, summarize such a complex history. So I will just to artificially go through the topics. So I'm happy to take any question uh, you have until the end. Uh, next slide, please. 
uh, I have to make an acknowledgement. Uh, the statements included in this presentation are all based on my own knowledge and the research and um, and the research and do not reflect to um, or represent organization that I am affiliated with. So this is a kind of, um, you know, just a controversial topic if it's app applied to the, you know, other countries. So I'm just going to say this is about uh, Japan. Uh, next, please. Japan's healthcare system is shaped by a unique and a complex history. So since 1961, Japan has provided universal health coverage, which allows uh, people to access to preventive, curative, and rehabilitative services at affordable cost cost. And uh, this is, um, you know, interesting also for anybody. You don't need to be Japanese to get the health care. If you establish you know, working in Japan, you can get this uh, universal health care. Next slide, please. Uh, I think it's uh, blocking with uh, uh, some top <laughs> part. But uh, um, so the Japan's uh, healthcare, mostly 98.3% um, were covered by SHIS, and there are two different categories. So one is the employer, uh, you know, covered by employer employment, and uh, so companies uh, cover partial health insurance, and the other one is uh, residential. So the uh, prefecture and partially uh, uh, government uh, pay for the part of the insurance. And then there's a small portion of the insurance um, covered by the um, low income uh, category, and uh, that's 1.7%. Japanese uh, low income category is much uh, less than, uh, uh, much more than uh, um, many other uh, countries in the world. So the uh, cutout uh, level is much higher. Next slide, please. So this is a, a explanation of the more, you know, details. I, because of time, uh, I am not going to go through in detail everything, but uh, the one of the key point is uh, uh, people uh, between age six to 70, their uh, out of pocket cost is about, uh, it's um, limited to the 20%, uh, 30%, and uh, 70 to 74 is 20%, and over uh, 75 is uh, usually 10%, 10 unless you have a really high income still, um, you know, high income level of people. And uh, age six, or younger, you get 20% out of pocket. So you might think that it's really high, you know, percentage you're paying, but the overall cost is actually not that high in Japan. I'll explain more. Next slide, please. So patients are free to select physicians and the facilities, so you can go any hospitals. And the hospitals are run by non-profit, basically uh, managed by physicians. And uh, for-profit companies, uh, corporations cannot run the hospital. That's uh, uh, regulation. And uh, um, doctors and nurses, uh, doctors and dentists and pharmacists license, and also nurses actually, is federal licensing. So there's a one standard. Next slide, please. So Japanese healthcare has a comprehensive um, medicine, and uh, so I said, you know, percentages might be rather high, but cost of medical equipment and drug are strictly regulated by Japanese government. So, for in order to, for Japanese government to cover everyone for you know healthcare, they cannot have the you know the equipments and dog, drugs to be really expensive. So they they regulate. And um, there is a comparison in the New York Times, uh, for example, for the just the material cost for without insurance between uh, England, Japan, and uh, US. 
and um, the cost of U uh, UK, England, and uh, Japan are about the same. However, the uh, US has about 20 to 100 times for the exact same materials. Also, the, each prefecture has a, a system to help uh, healthcare. And also, um, interestingly, uh, medical school has, uh, you know, um, the group of uh, students come in as free tuition, but after graduate, they go to uh, countryside, rural area for six to seven years. So that's uh, um, special education system for the health uh, distance medicine. And also the federal and local government are very active uh, introducing telemedicine from 2007 on and the doctor to doctor and doctor to patient telemedicine were actively used. Uh, doctor to doctor means you know people go to countryside um, they are not necessarily know everything you know something like specialized cancer cases they have to uh, consult with the doctor experts from a big hospital in a city. Next slide please. Uh, of course, a lot of people know about uh, Japan is a really, uh, you know, aging population. So they really uh, emphasize focusing on these uh, categories for the helping elderly. AI and robotics are especially uh, advanced. Next slide, please. Um, However, you know, Japan has a really comprehensive uh, medical system, but the portion of the government paying, uh, you can see the Japan in uh, uh, right side of the red uh, bar, and it's a, it's a little bit old, it was 2006 uh, data, but, uh, you know, Japan is about two thirds of the um, US, for example, the public, costs, you know, they're spending. And of course, uh, uh, the people's paying money is much, much less. Next slide, please. So I just want to go through the, you know, how we came there. And uh, let me start with the uh, fifth century. So the um, Japanese learned the medicine, herbal medicine from China. So early introduction happened in the 5th and 6th century. And uh, Japan also established their own Kampo medicine in uh, 1500. Toward the 1700, end of 1700, the Western Dutch and German medicine came in uh, through Nagasaki. That was the only place that was open um, to the outside. So Japan had, was closed to 1603 to um, 1858. So, um, but the, the one opening in Nagasaki and some Western medicine came in. So the uh, Japan shifted to the Western style medicine, and early uh, modern Japan, you know, temporary um, when the Japan opened the country to the West, realized you know we should do a more modern medicine. So they almost uh, banned prohibited to use a Kampo medicine. But uh, recent revival and uh, uh, of the Kampo and traditional medicine is very, very uh, active. And uh, some medical schools have, uh, you know, special um, branches for educate uh, young people for Kampo medicine. Next slide, please. Um, I just briefly want to mention because parallel to current uh, COVID, so 1918 flu in Japan, how they managed? They managed uh, by uh, wearing masks that became a, a mandatory and goggling, and as well as uh, um, taking some Kampo medicine. Uh, there is a nice article I just wanted to mention here, um, summarized uh, 1918 flu in Japan. Next slide, please. 1931 or 1931, to, uh, the end of the uh, World War II, Japan turned dark side. And uh, in the name of epidemic prevention, uh, Japan had a biological weapons project, um, commonly called Unit 731. And uh, Japan developed bioweapons and as well as had a human experiments um, 
happened. And that is not only Unit 731, but there are many units uh, throughout the China to Southeast Asia. So the headquarters was from Northern China to uh, Singapore. I was in National Library of Singapore, and they had uh, uh, this biological weapon, Japanese bi biological weapons document there. Okay, next slide, please. To the end, uh, Japan experienced atomic bombs, and from a health point of view, uh, that you know that was the first largest scale uh, civilian uh, experience of the. Uh, atomic bomb, and uh, for that reason, uh, U.S. Uh, National Academy of Science and two scientists uh, encouraged to have the ABCC Atomic Bomb Casualty Commission, and uh, they started two major studies, lifespan studies and children of atomic bombs, so genetic effect of radiation, children of atomic bombs, and how uh, life lifetime effects of uh, radiation and life, lifespan studies are still going on and the data is accumulate, accumulating. Also Japanese side, um, you know, Japanese government knew that the people were getting sick, so um, they established um, 1957 uh, special health insurance coverage. Next slide, please. Next, ah, sorry. So, um, allied occupation brought uh, new reform, including public health uh, in Japan and uh, new policies established. But I, I like the one uh, thing I like to uh, highlight. Margaret Sanger came and also the um, talked about uh, birth control and uh, uh, Japan established the 1948 uh, abortion law. Um, However, abortion and it was discussed in uh, 1880s, the, uh, as early as 1880s. And Japanese official, high officials are concerned about uh, eugenics. So basically their idea was uh, eugenics. And 1930s and 20s and 30s, uh, um, feminist movement, movement in Japan, they, women uh, activists talked about, uh, you know, abortion as uh, women's right. But the 1948 uh, law was named Protection of Eugenics Act, and still the name is there. And uh, as I was a, a child, I always wondered, looking at the sign on the front of the hospital, and what that mean? I, I never knew, you know, un, until like um, high school, what the eugenics was. So, so interesting. Um, next slide, please. So after the occupation, uh, Japan had a drastic uh, um, economic growth and uh, industrial revolution, second industrial revolution. And however, uh, lots of pollution disease came out. And it, it, this is kind of common for any country, to, you know, Britain to now China and everywhere. So, however, however, the, something unique about Japan is the um, people fought against and changed the law was uh, middle to low income housewives. So they um, talk to uh, politicians and, uh, you know, my kids are getting sick. You have to do something about it. So um, my good friend who teaches at uh, William and Mary, um, Robin LeBlanc, she wrote the interesting book called Bicycle Citizens about Japanese housewives, you know, actively changed many different laws. Next slide, please. Um, so Japan also had the drug hazards. Um, so um, like many other countries, thalidomide was uh, affected in Japan. Uh, quickly uh, stopped import. But also the 1980 uh, Green Cross uh, company, Green Cross Midori Juji, also had the HIV tainted blood product was distributed and by a lot of people got sick and uh, um, infected HIV. And again, citizens uh, group uh, forced the government to um, improve the law, pharmaceutical affairs law after this event and uh, 
new regulation of a clinical trial is happened, but uh, it's much more stricter than the American system, the FDA, until recently. And until, uh, so in order to promote uh, um, more drug development, Japan just most recently changed the law to uh, ease uh, the uh, drug trial system. If you're interested, I can talk to you more about that after this presentation. Next slide, please. Um, Council for Science, Technology and Innovation or established after two, uh, 1995 and the uh, focus of research funding is IPS cell, nanotechnology, cancer immunology and drug discovery. Um, there is a, a more recent two Nobel um, winners worked on IPS as well as cancer immunotherapy so that's uh, you know understandable that uh, government want to put more money into it. Next slide, please. I just like to mention briefly, since that's one of my uh, research, actually dissertation research on the women in science comparatively. And um, women studied abroad uh, as early as 1871-73. Okakura mission had a few women in the uh, um, Board to send to uh, Europe and uh, or US, and uh, they came back, became a founder of universities, and they did a PhD in uh, uh, US and Europe. And also, um, by 1940, uh, Japan had a, a very good health, uh, the child care system for uh, um, working mothers, and also. Equal opportunity law, the pay equality was established as early as 1985. And after 2000, um, under Abe administration, the much more push to promote women in science, uh, partially because uh, you know we are, we have shortage of the workers in general, but also the scientists, and um, that helped for the women scientists. So flexible um, research grant. If you have, if you are pregnant, you know you can shift your grant to the later year, or post childcare grants as well as uh, universities had had to hire, you know, some number of women after coming back uh, from uh, child care. And also paternal leave. So the uh, my friends, friend scientists in Japan, they take the turns because they don't want to delay the science research. So husband and wife taking, uh, you know, every six months, uh, up to six years, they take the uh, paternal leave. So next slide, please. So uh, gender equality blue uh, and the cabinet office was established and they continue to uh, try to improve the women's um, working uh, area. So next slide, please. The Japan's weakness came uh, surfaced uh, after the Fukushima accident. So they, we had, a, uh, Japan had the, the committee to uh, advise in case of accident, but the committee were not called in for the, you know, urgent situation. So they don't specialists had to uh, make a lot of decisions. And uh, also um, for mitigation, the the ministers and the agencies did not talk to each other. Now it's improved, but uh, so uh, redundancy of the mitigation happened. And also industry monopolies were uh, bad at that time, as well as um, I'm familiar with the uh, NRC Nuclear Regulatory Commission's uh, work here. And uh, Japan doesn't have that kind of centralized system. So, so they know it, you know, expert insight in on site to um, manage this kind of accident that was a big problem and health wise um, um, lots of mixed information was given to the um, the resident on Fukushima and they were really confused that's another reason I am starting I have started the uh, research on uh, the effect of radiation in the Fukushima area and trying to help uh, you know, people to articulate what the situation is. Next slide, please. 
you know, some uh, newspapers and uh, articles cover the why does Japan have lower death rates in uh, from uh, COVID-19 in the country. And I have talked to um, uh, scientists, public health officials, and uh, you know other government officials. And uh, these are things I like to share with you. Um, I'm not taking the position, but uh, these are information I got. Um, of course, uh, viral load, you know, how much virus go into your system is really uh, is uh, um, question for the, you know, the disease gets bad for the COVID-19 case. So Japan had a high subscription of mask wearing and uh, um, uh, it's from 1918, so everyone wear mask, and uh, also the um, th they practice the goggling. And uh, I know NIH has uh, uh, some research going on about different materials to use for goggling uh, right now. And uh, so goggling, you know, get rid of the, all the viruses from your throat. So that might be uh, helpful. The mask thing is uh, quite interesting because um, I had a, about two winters ago, um, postdoc came from Japan and wearing a really thick mask and at the airport. And I said, you know what, in this country, if you wear the mask, people think you're sick and uh, maybe you shouldn't wear in the public place. And she said, well, you know, I, I get sick if I wear if, if I don't wear a mask. So she was pretty uh, resistant, and uh, which was actually good now, you know, looking back. Um, but um, also the Japanese universal healthcare system really prevent people to wait to go to see a doctor or seek help. So. Um, before it gets bad, you know, they actually um, have checked. And also the um, government team, so last H1N1 uh, flu um, epidemic, uh, they already established the cluster management system and they, you know, the contact tracing. So they, it's a manpower, they uh, really respect uh, the privacy, so they don't use uh, like a cell phone system, but they uh, use more of the, like uh, once outbreak happens, you know, just calling people and uh, make sure, you know, they have uh, um, tested and stay, you know, quarantined. And the public attitude is very different because homogeneous country, so public compliance with government order is very strong. Next slide, please. Um, more, more other things. Um, so the uh, sculpture, ice sculpture uh, festival in Hokkaido, that brought the very early onset of, of the outbreak in Japan, and uh, it was uh, still, you know, this is a date of the October fourth, and still Hokkaido is really bad. But uh, what the people learned there is three C's. I, I, I said three C's. Um, Close the spaces with poor ventilation. You should avoid that. Crowded places with many people. You should avoid that. Close contact settings such as face-to-face uh, -face conversation. So three C's. And uh, also, um, some scientists said uh, uh, maybe Japanese had a uh, you know ex had exposed to different type of coronavirus, and maybe that's you know helped uh, Japanese to have the immunity against it. Still not uh, need a confirmation, and also lower obesity rates. So Japan has much lower obesity rates. So the uh, you know diabetes and heart uh, problems exist, but uh, you know the proportion is much less than uh, many European or um, America. So. And uh, uh, last one is interesting. So Japanese public are complaining about so Japan has a. Uh, much less testing, uh, but uh, most of the test is done by the uh, public health office, uh, and uh, but they have um, standardized the test. And uh, even though it takes a long time to get the result and, uh, you know, its number of testing is limited, uh, as I said earlier, so they do contact tracing and the combination with that, they have much less uh, false negative. 
So, you know, if you're negative, you say, oh, I'm okay, and, you know, spread the disease, that ha doesn't happen as much as uh, other countries. So, next slide, please. So, that's, um, um, uh, that's my presentation, and uh, if you have any question, I'm happy to answer. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Tomoko. That was a really informative conversation, and we've already got some questions coming in on the chat. A couple of things before we get into those questions, just to remind everybody, um, if you can please take a minute at the end to fill out the survey, there's either the QR code that you can scan with your phone actually directly off the, uh, the, the screen in front of you, or you can always go to the ULR address. Um, I mistakenly ask you to put your questions in the Q&A box, which I've been told has actually been uh, disabled for technical reasons. Um, there are a few questions in the chat box. Please go ahead if you have any questions, comments, issues you'd like us to explore during the Q&A. Put those in the chat box and again, if you can identify yourself and perhaps where you're from. Um, and with that, actually, I'll jump into the first question that I think is a fantastic one from a GW student, Hope Kim, who asked, um, my question is about the health reforms after World War II and studies after the bombings and whether ethnic minorities were included in those reforms. As I know during that time, ethnic minorities, especially Koreans were heavily discriminated against and not considered real Japanese. And Tomoko, before you answer, if I can actually expand on that, um, I'm thinking obviously not only about Koreans, but for instance, the Ainu up in Hokkaido and such. Is there a history of not only discrimination, but also using um, ethnic minorities and internal colonialism for medical research in Japan? Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. Um, there is a controversy uh, of some, actually not only Koreans and um, uh, but uh, also the um, hostage, you know, the P POW of Americans were in uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And uh, now it's much more resolved, but uh, it took a long time for them to be identified and to get this uh, health insurance. It's successfully now uh, people in, uh, in from Korea have the health insurance. Um, if they are not, they should talk to the Japanese government. But uh, the, according to the government record, they said there is. A, I know that somebody passed away from Kyoto University. He actively uh, helped for the Korean population to get uh, health insurance, special uh, atomic bomb health insurance, and um, um, they succeeded. Eventually, succeeded in more recent years, and. Uh, I am not aware of the Ainu and maybe even Okinawan people or, you know, um, ethnic Koreans uh, were tested. Well, my, the atomic bomb thing is one aside, but um, for the medical research, uh, Koreans potentially during the World War II, I am not aware of it enough. But uh, for the biological weapons project, political um, uh, criminals, uh, so political um, activists were also the subject to the biological weapons testing. So they're potentially Korean, and we need more research on that. And uh, that's one of my research area as well, for biological weapons um, history. So I'm happy to look into it. If you can give me an email address, I'm happy to stay in touch with you. Fantastic. Um, we've got a couple of other uh, questions that are trickling in and they're they're great because they're going to take you all over the place. So um, <laughs> to go even further back in time, Ethan Singh, who is another GW student, uh, history and international affairs major, um, he asked, uh, did the Dutch trading with the Japanese at Nagasaki have as much of an impact on the introduction of Western med medicine as the later <laughs> modernization of Japan in the Meiji era? So, um, yes, that's a good question. That's a slide I, t I had to take it out because I limited the number. Um, yes, there 
Kempel and uh, Siebold, those are two key people, um, came to, actually they were German uh, through the Dutch connection and uh, introduced the medicine and a lot of uh, Japanese went to study uh, before the Meiji period. And uh, unfortunately there are some um, accusation of the stealing uh, map for the Seabolt's case. So he was expelled uh, before the Meiji period started. So, however, uh, Japanese new Meiji government uh, really keen about uh, learning about uh, Western medicine. So, they sent a huge number of people to uh, Germany. And so, because of those tradition of Seabolt and Kempel, uh, probably uh, they send the people to study um, especially medicine in Germany and Leipzig, that's where it was. And the leading Japanese microbiologist who, um, did the discovery uh, by studying there under Koch, uh, Robert Koch. So um, there's a really rich history of that. Again, if you email me, I'm happy to chat more about that. That's so generous of you, Tomoko, and I, I would uh, really encourage the uh, students in particular to take you up on that. Oh, definitely, and yeah. Jumping forward in time, uh, yet another GW student, Alex Shusko, asks, uh, Japan has a relatively high transit use rate compared to the United States. How do you think this has affected the spread of uh, COVID in Japan? You said trans... Transit, mass transit. Ah, transit. Ah, yeah, yeah. Ah, yeah. But I think it's uh, because of the mask usage and the goggling, it might be, uh, you know, uh, helpful. So that's a good study to do, really. Uh, that's a pu good public health study to need to be done because, um, you know, how much of the mask helps? and uh you know musk and goggling system so that that's a very good question actually as a follow-up related to that uh, there were some studies out of new york city that were saying one of the key um, um venues of transmission was through the the subway and yes. about um cleaning on the subway and and i wonder if part of it might also be uh, the the relative cleanliness and how often uh, Japanese mass transit is clean could that be a part of what's going on as well? That is very good point. I'm just going to publish a paper on microbiome in the different uh, transit and uh, for different big cities. So that's uh, my research also, and um, I think that's that's a really good point also. And however, you know the. Um, COVID is uh, airborne, so, you know, still just uh, being there together with some, you know, super spreader, uh, that's uh, questionable also, but, clean, you know, cleaning is probably uh, definitely reduced uh, amount. And the surf, um, surface study is done by the Muruti National Library studies, and uh, also the, you know, on surface about three days, uh, this COVID-19 stays. So mm -hmm. that's that's one study already done, yeah. Fantastic. Um, we've got a question from Laura Wong from the National Library of Medicine. Um, and she asks, despite government programs for uh, the promotion of gender equality, are there still social realities uh, that are obstacles? Um, so despite the, the, the government uh, policies, um, does society put, put um, things in the way as it were? Yeah, um, actually, so that's a very good question and we need to do more studies for that. Um, and uh, I was talking to one of the professors at GW, uh, maybe we should write a book about this exact topic. And uh, she's a sociologist and, uh, you know, I can come, up, come in with the science and uh, women and career issue. But um, you know, legal system is really is a fundamental starting point, right? So, you know, many countries don't have this uh, equal pay uh, system still, and uh, Japan at least has. So, also the uh, government office is really, um, cabinet office is really pushing for that um, issue. 
well, partially because lack of, uh, you know, the workers, we, you know, Japan doesn't have enough workers. And that's an interesting, you know, twisted way of the motivation. But uh, also the, my personal um, information, the science is much more uh, progressive than uh, company system. Company has uh, lots of uh, discrimination issues still. And um, there's a famous, uh, the um, Belgian author, there's a, it became a movie, I can't remember the title, but it's, uh, it, uh, working at the Japanese company and uh, it, it does happen. But I was at the National Institute of Genetics and uh, half and half of the women and uh, men faculty. So just to depend on the field, I think. Um, if not, uh, ask a kind of tangentially related question, specifically about COVID. I mean, mm -hmm. at least in the popular press, there's a lot of reporting about the relatively uh, low uh, mortality rates and, and death rates uh, amongst the elder population in Japan. I'm wondering, um, how is the uh, the young population, how are children faring in Japan? And I'm also asking this as a parent, oh, um, you know, are, are, are children back in school? Um, is there a widespread use of daycare for children now? Um, and are there any, any studies coming out on whether or not, because uh, it seems like one of the big questions is to what extent are children spreaders, um, not only amongst themselves, but also between themselves and adults? So children, again, um, they are so obedient <laughs> compared to many other countries. <laughs> so, you know, they, they're really strictly wearing masks and washing hands all the time and the gargling. <laughs> so, you know, it's a culturally quite different from uh, compared to other countries. And the East, East Asian countries are like that. And uh, but um, let me find the article, you know, Ben, I will send you um, you know, anything I find. I don't have it in front of me, but that's a very good question. So thank you. Great, we've got a number of other questions that are coming in, some even practical. Um, but uh, this one from Wu Zhen, who's a Georgetown student, um, and he asked, what are the major reasons why traditional medicine uh, is seeing a popular resurgence in Japan? Um, so I think it's one of the reasons is uh, uh, Japanese government puts the traditional medicine into the the healthcare system. So so the it's covered by the health insurance, and uh, there is a very uh, much reliable company, Tsumura, um, established you know very clean um, and high standard uh, medicine, powder medicine, uh, produce and uh, for co uh, commercially and hospital. Uh, use. So I think that's one of the things, you know, um, you don't need to worry about uh, contamination for the Japanese uh, Kampo system. So, um, you know, the some of the imported materials has a heavy metal in it and so on. So there is no concern as well as uh, doctors now is actively using and doctors are educated for the, you know, they have a double measure of Western and, uh, you know, Eastern medicine. They can do that in uh, major universities, including KO University and uh, Kitazato and or leading places. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, we've got another question from a GW student uh, from Alice Reese who asked, uh, that I understand pre-existing conditions such as obesity are less common in Japan, but she goes on, I was wondering if any studies have been focused on respiratory conditions from smoking. Mm -hmm. My personal experiences in Japan left me with an impression, which I think is correct as well, that smoking is uh, quite prevalent there, at least more so than here in the United States. Mm -hmm. That's a very, very good question. And also the Chinese case of the uh, smoking, yeah, that's a discussed. Let me let me find the article again, um, you know, stay in touch with me and I'm happy to um, find the information and get back to you. But uh, smoking is a very, very good uh, issue we should uh, think about. Um, However, now is uh, Japan a lot of um, non-smoking areas, and uh, you know, flight now it's completely banned, and uh, so they are moving toward the more European uh, systems. So. 
We have a practical question from Sarah G from Texas, who uh, is soon moving to Japan. And she asks, um, as someone moving uh, to Japan from the United States, do you have advice so far as to how to transition? Oh, I'm sorry, other way around, um, moving from Japan to the United States. Do you have advice so far as to how to best transition into the US healthcare system? Um, that's a good question because uh, I, so if you are working in uh, this country, you should be able to get um, health insurance from the you know employer. And um, I I am familiar with the healthcare system, but it depends on the you know type of work uh, you are going to do. It's it's quite different, and uh, unlike Japan, you know universal system is does not yet uh, exist here. So um, I'm happy to you know talk about it in a specialized way. So again, email me, and I'm happy to talk to you. We've got a couple more minutes remaining, so I'd encourage uh, those of you listening in, if you have more questions, please do put them in the chat box. Um, I have a question actually uh, for you, Tomoko, as mm -hmm. an academic, as a female academic in science. And I wonder if you could um, compare and contrast your experience as a woman working in science in the, in the medical field um, in Japan, as opposed to your experience here in the United States. Um, I, I often say this, and I'm not sure I'm concerned about <laughs> saying in this um, public talk, but so when um, I was in Japan, uh, because I studied pharmacology, clinical pharmacology, and worked in Tokyo University Hospital, you know, I was pretty much uh, surrounded by really supportive people. And uh, one year I spent, you know, doing a theoretical genetics research in Japan also. It's, uh, it was really a uh, nice environment. And the first time I came to um, Cornell, um, the, my senior um, female graduate students told me, don't let people think you are a woman. And that was the first shock. I never thought about this. And uh, they said, I should not wear a uh, skirt, especially short skirt. And people think you are a woman, you'll be treated differently. That's what I was told. And I never thought about it because I went to prep school, uh, you know, from age kindergarten all the way to um, high school. And uh, then, you know, studied pharmacology. I never thought about, and uh, actually, because up to uh, high school, I was in a science major, so mostly boys in a class, it's much less women, you know, and um, so like uh, many countries, but nobody treated me differently. And uh, I, I never thought about that difference. And also when I talked about uh, this uh, women's um, uh, daycare uh, for kids for the women faculties in um, 1940. So the very standardized daycare system was established throughout Japan. And um, when I said this in one of my talks, one of the faculty member uh, in the audience who later on found so never married, and she said, you know, in America, we separate career and the family life, she said. And I said, what? You know, I just never thought about, so you should not have a child until 10 years. That's another thing I was told. And uh, when I started my PhD, I was, I already had a one year old child. And they said, you're not going to be successful because you already have a child. You shouldn't have a child until you get tenure. That's, that's a, those are things, a shocking thing. So um, I found uh, my colleagues doing quite well in Japan. And uh, I tell my students to go to Scandinavian countries because, you know, you don't need to worry about these issues to female students. Well, hopefully we're, we're undergoing a, a generational change, perhaps in attitudes here in the United States in the academy and catching up with some of our colleagues. Um, we have a, another question from in Texas, which actually joins uh, medicine with education. And she asked, 
How does special education work in Japan and has it been affected or changed with COVID? Uh, which special education? I wonder if she's talking about. Uh, she doesn't specify here, but um, for instance, here in the United States, when we have children with special needs. Um, oh, oh, that's special education. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. So we have a special education system. Um, and um, I haven't followed up, the, you know, after COVID, what's happening. But uh, the fundamentally, so the our prep school had a special education um group of stu students in the same school and uh, you know we are encouraged to mix with them and uh you know just to um try to respect them so that that was a system uh, i grew up with and uh it's a good question um that's again um if you're in touch i will try to find out very important question Great. Well, we have timer one, one or two more questions. So if you do have any pressing questions, please put them in the chat box. Um, I'm going to ask you a wholly unfair question, Tomoko, and I say that uh -huh. as a historian. Um, uh -huh. I, I know it's unfair to ask people about the future, um, but I wonder uh, from your position and given your specialty and expertise, um, how does this end in Japan? How does COVID end and, and how do you think this is going to going to um, you know, work itself out. Obviously, here in the United States, we're having all kinds of um, debates about not only the public health measures you've also uh, you've already discussed, but you know, wh what's going to happen if and when we get a vaccine and distribution and, and such like that. So I wonder, um, you know, wh what do you see uh, in J uh, for Japan as we hopefully move to a post COVID era? whenever that might be. Yeah, so um, Japan already have a soft opening and, uh, you know, people are uh, going around. And so it seems that, uh, you know, I often look at the case of Sweden and it's uh, depend on, you know, how you, the population manage the uh, viral load, you know, the, they, for them to expose to the, you know, heavy viral load. And um, Japan has been doing well. It's a very simple thing, the way mask and uh, um, just the gargling and also the, you know, hygiene of the washing hand when you go home. And it, make sure to have the 3C, you know, just the distance and avoid the crowd. So I think in Japan, especially after the vaccine, um, they should be able to manage it, no problem. It's like, it became like a flu, I think. And um, also the um, subscription of the uh, vaccine is very good in Japan. It's in the school system and uh, as well as uh, working, you know, the company, everyone uh, actually subscribe that. And um, they they don't actually probably think hard about, you know, like, uh, you know, more critical thinking in this country is very much I respect. And uh, they don't think hard about, say, you know, the uh, potential side effects and you know, um, risking by taking a vaccine. So they just, you know, government say they should do, they sh they do, that's, that's a cultural thing, a difference. And I, I wouldn't say good or bad. Uh, I don't take my position to, you know, either end, but uh, that's how they can probably manage it. And, uh, you know, economy can open, no problem. Well, related to that on the vaccine, um, a, a twofold question. Number one is, is the Japanese government um, involved either through a public-private partnership or through its own research funding in developing a vaccine? Um, and secondly, have they uh, discussed it all in public uh, plans for a vaccine distribution? Um, because especially with the relatively vulnerable elder population and its size in Japan, it seems like uh, distribution of a vaccine when it does come out um, could be uh, problematic with some bottlenecks. Yeah, um, so distribution part, uh, let me get back to you. I was just in the middle of the talking to uh, health officials uh, from Japan and, uh, you know, 
I mean, close touch with both uh, mixed and uh, also the Minister of Health. So I will let you know. Um, what was the first question? Sorry. Oh, if Japan is independently pursuing uh, yeah, yeah. the research. So research, yeah, they do uh, collaborate with uh, um, private sectors as well. Yeah, and uh, promote uh, um, the development, especially vaccine. They have a lot of money uh, putting in, um, compa <laughs> not the comparable to US, but so, you know, the country, small country, so. Right. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, we've taken uh, your time right up to the end of our time together. So thank you so much, Tomoko, for a, a wide ranging and very informative uh, conversation. Thank you all for participating. Again, I encourage you to fill out the survey. Um, Tomoko has offered a number of times to be in touch uh, and follow up with questions, especially yes. from the students. Um, and in the chat box, she has uh, very kindly offered her email address, Georgetown. I'd strongly encourage anybody interested to go ahead and, and follow up with that. Um, yeah. It's been a pleasure talking to you, Tomoko, and we look forward to welcoming you again at the East Asia National Resource Center. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your time.